Go ahead. Okay, we're continuing on. Uh, so earlier we started getting into nuclear chemistry, a good chunk of it earlier. Um, so earlier we did talk about obviously balancing equations, which as we saw is not too difficult. Really a periodic table and the notion of adding is pretty much what you need on that. Uh, remember that it really is the uh, atomic number that's really kind of important in determining what is sort of missing or what element may be formed. Uh, then obviously you could do your uh, mass number accordingly. As we talked about, obviously, uh, understanding the different particles and the mass number, atomic number associated with them uh, will definitely help in balancing those equations. We talked about stability and the neutron to proton ratio, and that is one way or a very common way that you can look at stability of a nuclei. Uh, it's by calculating that, again, anywhere up to about 20 protons, a ratio of one is pretty stable, uh, up to about 40, from 20-ish to 40, uh, about 1.25, and above that there to about 80 uh, is about 1.5. Anything above 84 is pretty much going to be radioactive for sure. Uh, remember that if it is sort of radioactive or not a really good stable ratio of uh, neutrons to protons, the uh, nuclei will go undergo a decay process in an effort to sort of fix that ratio. Uh, again, if it's sort of too high, it will do a beta decay. If it's a little too low, it could positron emission or electron capture, which as we saw earlier, will result in basically the same uh, element being formed. Other things that we look at in terms of stability, again, a lot of times is, uh, you know, even, even, in terms of protons and neutrons is really the most sort of stable uh, number of nuclei to have that. The worst situation is a odd, odd situation in terms of neutrons and protons. Uh, very few are stable with that. I think it was like only three of them or so are stable in that sort of arrangement. Um, we talked about also the DK series, which again is a process of radioactive decay, which continues until something basically hits something that's stable at some point, which will stop the decay process. And we saw that you could basically do it one of two ways, either do it sort of equation wise, where the product of the first equation becomes a reactant in the second one until you get to the end of your decay series. Or again, you could sort of mathematically, if you're just maybe interested in the end product based on how many alpha or beta decays there may be, uh, you could kind of mathematically maybe figure out what's going on uh, if all you have going on are those type of decays. We finished up earlier talking about really kinetics and radioactive decay, and it does follow pretty much as you saw first order kinetics, like we talked about at the very beginning of the semester. Um, and you could use obviously kinetics to figure out things like we did, uh, you know, how much would be left over of a radioactive uh, nuclei, uh, how much in terms of half life, or how much time it would take for something. Uh, to sort of get there, and also obviously how old something is through dating. As we saw, it basically works the same way as a regular kinetics problem. The only difference is we do use sort of different units in those equations, and you can use, as you saw, pretty much any units, uh, grams, milligrams, and also rates are very commonly used uh, with radioactive decay, in addition uh, to using, obviously, the um, half-life equation and the integrated rate law as well. It's also very, very common. Any questions on any of that stuff we talked about earlier? All right, so uh, we're now gonna talk about sort of where does the uh, energy from fission comes from. Um, fission, if you remember, we talked about a little bit earlier as well. Uh, fission is the idea of you have basically this uh, kind of unstable nucleus and it's not really happy. So it will go through a process of decay. And when it decays, typically what will happen in a fission reaction is it will basically break apart into two new sort of nucleuses. Uh, usually will generate some neutrons along the way. And a lot of times it will give off some energy as well. So the process of fission is pretty much that, something that's unstable decays, breaks apart into some new guys gives off some neutrons and also some energy. 
Um, as I mentioned before, this can happen sort of spontaneously. It could also happen by kind of initiated, which is sometimes referred to as transmutation, where you kind of take a particle and kind of shoot it at something that's stable. It gets a little unhappy when that happens and becomes unstable and then sort of kicks off sort of the fission reaction uh, to take place. But there is sort of a, a difference that occurs uh, in the process of making an actual nucleus and really the atomic mass of uh, the isotope and really the particles that make up the nucleus. So during a fission reaction, some of the mass of the nucleus uh, is converted into energy. And one way that you could calculate that is our good friend Einstein, I think, looks like his equation. So E is our energy, M is our mass, or whatever we refer to a lot of times as the mass defect. That sort of difference in mass that gets kind of converted into energy is really what is sometimes referred to here as the mass defect. And that in this equation would be M. C is the speed of light, right? Which is uh, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Uh, so you can actually use that formula there to figure out uh, the energy, um, which is referred to as the binding energy, which is this energy that is really the difference between the masses of the neutrons, protons that make up the nucleus and actually sort of the atomic mass of the isotope. So for each mole of uranium-235, the physicist that produces about 1.7 times 10 to the 13 joules of energy. If you compare that to a very exothermic reaction, uh, you're only about 10 to the 6 joules of energy. The comparison there is really because in a nuclear power plant, that is pretty much what they use, uranium. And they use it to sort of power the nuclear power plant, it gives off a lot of energy. Traditional power plants are like coal. You burn it and you use the heat from that, which is an exothermic type reaction. But you can see you get a lot more energy out in that sort of fission reaction than you do in sort of a traditional uh, exothermic reaction, which is why they use it in a nuclear safe power plant. So that mass defect and binding energy, which again is sort of that difference in the mass of the nucleus and um, the actual isotope itself. When the nucleus forms, the mass of the separate nucleons are converted into energy. Once again, when we talk about nucleons here, uh, really uh, it is what's in the nucleus, which again is our protons and our neutrons. Usually what a nucleon refers to. Uh, so that difference between, like I said, really the mass of how many protons, neutrons you have and the mass of the isotope, that little bit will be converted into energy. And that energy is released from the nucleus when it forms. And that's what is referred to as the binding energy. And there's a couple of conversions and none of these are negative. These are just PowerPoints. So these conversions sometimes are helpful and can be helpful in some of these calculations. One mega electron volt is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. Also uh, one atomic mass unit, AMU which is like uh, the atomic mass that we use from the periodic table. Uh, defect is equal to 931.5 mega electron volts. Now we talked about sort of the neutron to proton ratio as a way of looking at stability. Another way that you can sort of look at stability or compare a couple of things is if you do know the binding energy per nucleon. The binding energy per nucleon is usually given in one of two units. They're usually given in either joules per nucleon or mega electron volts per nucleon. So these are the two sort of common units for binding energy. Um, and that also can be used to look at stability. So the higher the binding energy per nucleon, the more stable that nucleus is. Uh, so that's one way, again, if you do have those values given to you or you calculated those values, uh, you can basically uh, determine, you know, which one would be more stable nucleus based on the binding energy per nucleon. So let's take a look at, for example, here and figure out some of this nuclear binding energy, which is the energy required to break up a nucleus into its protons and neutrons. If we took the uh, fluorine-19 isotope, it has an atomic mass of 18.9984 AMU. 
And if we want to figure out the mass defect, the binding energy, and all that kind of stuff, we could do some calculations here. The first thing we'd want to figure out is uh, if we take our fluorine 19 and 9, obviously from the periodic table, that means that we do have nine protons and our number of neutrons in this case would be 19 minus nine, which would be 10 neutrons. So if we figure out the mass defect here, which would be that difference between the mass of those protons and neutrons and the mass of the isotope, we can figure that out by taking uh, nine times the atomic mass of a proton, which is 1.007825 AMU. And that is the atomic mass of a proton. We would add it to our 10 times the atomic mass of a neutron, uh, which is 1.008665 AMU. And again, that would be the atomic mass of a neutron, right? Atomic mass of a proton, basically. And if we subtract that from the atomic mass of the isotope, which is 18.9984 AMU, we get uh, 9 times 1.007825 plus 10 times 1.008665 minus 18.9984. That gives us uh, 0 0.1587 AMU, which is the mass defect here. So what we did is basically take the components of the nucleus and this fluorine, the protons and the neutrons. We subtracted from the atomic mass of the isotope. And that difference of mass is what's going to be sort of converted into energy via this process when it is formed, uh, when the nucleus is formed in this case and really released uh, from the atom. Any questions so far? To figure out sort of what the energy is, you could do one of two things. You could use uh, Einstein's equation there. Uh, e is equal to mc squared. And if we put in our numbers where this would be our mass defect, 0 0.1587 AMU times 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second squared, that will give us here. Not that. Try that again. There we go. Three to the eight squared times 0.1587. Going to give us uh, 1.43 times 10 to the 16. The units here are AMU meter squared second squared. Now, you may remember that a joule is equal to a kilogram meter squared second square. And obviously a joule is a unit of energy. So we could actually do a conversion to convert us into joules by doing this. There are uh, 6.022 times 10 to the 26 AMU in a kilogram. Avogadro's number is to the 23, which is grams, right? So 26 would get you to kilograms, yeah? So that's why it's 26. And it kind of looks like Avogadro's number because it is. Uh, the AMU here will cancel. So if we take our 1.43 to the 16, divided by 6.022 to the 26, again, just to put us into the right units there, that will give us 2.37 times 10 to the minus 11 joules. And that's because basically that is the same as a kilogram meter squared, second squared, right? So that's how we get to joules. That would be the binding energy in joules. And it's very often reported in 
uh, joules per nucleon. Nucleon is our protons and neutrons. So in this case, our nucleon is 19, which is basically the mass number here. So if we take that and go 2.37 times 10 to the minus 11 joules divided by 19 nucleons, we will then get about 1.25 to the minus 12. joules per nucleon. And that would be the binding energy in joules per nucleon. Any questions on that there? Now, again, a very common unit is also mega electron volts uh, per nucleon. So we could actually convert that as well into the other unit by using the conversion we saw on the previous page. That there are uh, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 13 joules in a mega electron volt. So if I take that divided by 1.602 to the minus 13, gets me something like uh, 7.802 mega electron volts per nucleon would be our other common unit of binding energy. So there's just kind of two different ways to report the binding energy per nucleon. Any questions on that there? Now, there is an alternative approach that you could do where you uh, do not use uh, Avogadro's numbers. You do not use uh, Einstein's equation. And that is you could actually do this calculation and kind of take the mega electron volts root first by using these, equa these kind of conversions here. They're really based off of Einstein's equation. And if you chose that route where it would take you probably to mega electron volts first, you can actually pick it up right here where we calculated the mass defect and you could do what we saw there, which was there's 931.5 mega electron volts in an AMU. And if you did that 0. 0.1587 times 931.5 gets you about 147.83 mega electron volts which then if you divided it by 19 nucleons would basically get you down to there. Give or take a little bit with rounding, you get 7.78, which is about 7.8. So it's pretty darn close as well. So that's an alternative approach uh, that you can actually go to mega electron volts first using that conversion. You could also use the other one that was on that page and go to joules as well, this conversion here and take it to joules and kind of avoid uh, using Einstein's equation. So you could kind of do it either way. Uh, they both will get you basically the same answer. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? So if we wanted to look at stability or compare fluorine to some other ones, uh, we could look at, again, the binding energy per nucleon as a measure of stability. Again, the higher the binding energy per nucleon, the more stable something is. Um, and again, this is basically the amount of energy uh, that's going to be released as a result of that difference in mass between the protons and neutrons in the nucleus and the actual atomic mass of the isotope. Any questions on that one there? All right, so why don't you uh, try, I will take a look here. Here is a graph of nuclear binding energy per nucleon. And as we see, really our highest guy there is uh, iron 56 is really the most stable. And again, you could do some comparisons of others. Anybody below that would be a little bit less stable. Um, and again, the lower the binding energy per nucleon, uh, the less stable it's going to be. That's what we see there. So most stable nuclei will basically fall in that area where we see iron, 56. Again, outside of that, those guys will do some fission or fusion to try to get to that area there. 
why don't you try one here, calculate the uh, mass defect and the nuclear binding energy per nucleon in mega electron volts. Why don't we do both? Why don't we do joules as well per nucleon? For carbon 16, that has an atomic mass of 16.0147. Let me put those numbers in there for you. Protons atomic mass, uh, 1.007825 AMU and a neutron being okay let's uh take a look uh so uh, we'll start with carbon 16 uh we'll go to periodic table carbon steel number six i think uh that means in terms of protons uh we got six of them uh in terms of neutrons we will have 10 again here 16 minus six will give us 10. So the first thing we want to do is really calculate the mass defect here. Uh, so our mass defect uh, will be our six protons, each at 1.007825 AMU, plus our 10 neutrons at 1.008665. We then will subtract that from the atomic mass of our carbon-16 isotope. Uh, which is 16.014701 AMU. So again, this is going to give us the mass difference between our protons and neutrons and the mass of the isotope uh, that really is going to be converted into energy through this process. And it looks like we end up uh, with here 14701. Uh, looks like about uh, 0 0.1189 AMU in this case. <clears throat> so since we did want it originally in mega electron volts per nucleon, we could use that conversion uh, that we saw on the previous page, uh, that one AMU of mass defect is 931.5 mega electron volts. So using that guy, 1189 AMU, gives us an AMU 931.5 mega electron volts. Uh, we'll times it by 931.5. Gets us about, uh, we'll call it about 110.8 mega electron volts. And if we divide it by our nucleon, which is our protons and neutrons, that is 16 nucleon, which is basically our mass number. Gets us about 6.922 mega electron volts per nucleon. Any questions on that one there? We also wanted joules. So we could at this point, since we kind of took that approach, use the other conversion that we had, which was 1.602 times 10 to the minus 13 joules is equal to a uh, mega electron volt. So if we took our 6.922 mega electron volts per nucleon, uh, here we would multiply by our 1.602 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. Would give us approximately uh, 1.1 times 10 to the minus 12 joules per nucleon. Any questions on either of those there? You obviously also could have went into equals MC squared. I uh, used Avogadro's number there to 26 and converted it out to joules first and then uh, came into the mega electron volts going the back end. Any questions on that one there? All right, let's try one more here. Uh, <clears throat> Calculate the bonding energy per nucleon of iron 56. Again, there, the mass of iron 56. Let's do it. Uh, we'll do it both ways one more time. Uh, we'll do mega electron volts per nucleon and joules per nucleon. Why not? Once again, uh, protons 1.0. That means to the periodic table we go and looks like 26 there. That's going to give us for our protons 26. Again, from our neutrons, mass number minus atomic number. That looks like a big 30 there. 
So we'll start with our mouse defect here. And again, we'll take our um, 26 protons in this case, times it by the atomic mass of a proton. And there's also 30 neutrons in that nucleus. So we'll get the mass of those guys. And again, we're going to basically take that and the difference there between the mass of the isotope which on these problems they like to use a lot of digits. There we go. Uh, so we got 26 times uh, 1.007825. Uh, plus uh, 30 times 1.008665. Subtracting 55.9394. Gets us a uh, mass defect here of 0.5285 AMU. Uh, once again, here you do have the couple of options. Uh, if we took the uh, equals MC square approach, you would then put that number in there just to show it to you one more time. Uh, 0.5285 AMU. Uh, we would then take three times 10 to the eight meters per second and square it. Uh, so we'll take that times three to the eight squared. That would get us uh, 4.76 times 10 to the 16 AMU meter squared, second squared. There's where we need to use our Avogadro's number. AMU per kilogram. And that would then convert it into joules for us. And if we did that, it looks like we would end up with about uh, 7.9 times 10 to the minus 11 joules that we can then divide by our nucleon, which would be 56 in this case. And that would give us one of our answers that we were looking for, which would be 1.4 times 10 to the minus 12 joules per nucleon. At that point, since I took this uh, route, I could then convert joules into mega electron volts using the conversion we had. And again, you might get a slightly different number depending on where you rounded a little bit, but it should definitely be in the same ballpark. Um, and that would be 1.602 times 10 to the minus 13 joules is a mega electron volt. So we'll take that divided by 1.602 minus 13. Going to give us about 8.80 mega electron volts per nucleon. And again, should be somewhere in that ballpark, depending on sort of which way you went. Yeah. It will ask specifically for it in one or the other. So just since we're doing these, we'll just do both of them, but they usually will specify one unit or the other. If it doesn't specify, then technically you can leave it in either one of the units would be fine, yeah. Yeah, so on this one, um, probably um, really uh, probably four-ish for mega electron volts is probably what you really should maybe go to as that's usually what sort of atomic mass and molar mass is given to you. Uh, but technically speaking, you would have to kind of follow the whole thing through with all those decimals. So um, probably a couple decimal places is probably sufficient. But um, in this case, really the only number that we had technically is the 55.93494 number, um, which we were subtracting which technically means we should have went to really um, that many decimal places on this number. Then we would do the multiplication part and stuff like that. So um, probably whatever sig figs your uh, mass defects ends up at is probably the kind of the sig figs that really the final number should be, even though I probably didn't go there with the other ones, but that's really what it should probably end up being. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, um, it doesn't matter which method you use. It doesn't. So uh, it doesn't matter which method you use. Um, some books will use kind of the uh, non um, Einstein approach, and some books will use the Einstein approach and stuff like that. I don't honestly recall off the top of my head which one the uh, OpenStax used, but um, 
I almost think they use, uh, I almost think they might use the Einstein approach, but I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, take the easy way. I, I would probably do it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? No. Uh, really, the the easy way, which is the conversions, are really based off Einstein's equation anyway. So that's why they obviously come out the same. Yeah. So as I mentioned before, we can use these values here, which is why we partially did everybody to both of the uh, different units uh, to as a measure of stability. So if we look at iron 56 and we just look at, say, mega electron volts, it has a value of like 8.8. .8. Uh, if we go back to the one that we did, which was carbon 16, it had about 6.9. And if we did our original guy there, which was our fluorine, uh, we saw that we had about 7.8. So based on binding energy per nucleon, we saw that the iron 56 was really the most stable out of those three, as it had the highest binding energy per nucleon, which is what we expect and saw in this graph. Right there's our iron 56. And the next more stable one would actually be the fluorine based on the three that we did as it had like 7.8 for his binding uh, energy per nucleon, followed by, I guess it was the carbon uh, 16 there that had the lowest binding energy per nucleon. So again, this is another way that if you do have those values or you calculate them, uh, you could use them as a measure of stability for each of those uh, isotopes. Any questions on that there? Say again. Yeah, that's uh, that's mega electron volts is a unit of energy, yeah, just like a joule, basically, is a, a comparable sort of unit in there. Yeah, per nucleon just basically means that's how much energy per basically the proton and neutrons that are in the nucleus is going to be sort of given off uh, per length. Okay. All right. Uh, so. Uh, Talk a little bit about nuclear transmutation. As I mentioned before, uh, you could do a fission reaction and it can happen sort of spontaneously. You could also basically kind of initiate that fission reaction to occur by really uh, shooting a particle at a, a nucleus. It might become a little unstable and unhappy and make somebody else. One way you could do that is magnetic field, electrical field, the particle accelerator, they have charges, right? So get a spinning really quick and then shoot it at the target there. And this is a table of the transuranium elements. And uh, they're basically all, as you can see here, pretty much made by initiating, by shooting some type of particle at a element, which will make it go through that. It's where all those fun names come from, those man-made guys like California, Einsteinium, uh, berkelium and so forth. Uh, they're really made by sort of bombarding a, a stable nucleus with some type of particle that's going to cause it to go through really a fission reaction and produce some new elements along the way here uh, where we get all those guys, pretty much those guys on the bottom row of the periodic table. So in that process of transmutation and nuclear fission, this is essentially what happens in this case they're shooting like a neutron here at a uranium-235 element, which is pretty stable. Once that neutron hits there, it turns it into a bowling pin and it becomes very unstable. It will then basically split off into two new nucleuses. The result of that is it will also generate several neutrons usually in the process. And most importantly, it will also generate a lot of energy uh, in that process as well. And again, um, there's our comparison uh, between uranium and coal, which again is really the two ways that power plants are traditionally sort of run. Um, and again, you can see a lot more energy in our, in our fission reaction than it is in our sort of traditional exothermic coal reaction. Now, do you always get the same products every time you do a fission reaction? The answer is no, um, but there is sort of predictable sort of products a lot of times that you will get, but you really don't always get the same two guys that break off there, uh, but guys with mass numbers in those sort of range uh, are typical products that will happen in sort of fission reactions here of uh, what you get but again it won't always be those same two guys that come off 
what is sort of constant though is you definitely will get some neutrons that come off and definitely some energy that will be sort of released in those processes when you do it and when we talk about the fission reaction is used in several things uh one type of thing that can be sort of problematic is a nuclear chain reaction and a nuclear chain reaction is basically a self-sustaining sequence of nuclear fission reactions so if you have what is referred to as the critical mass of some type of fissionable material like uranium it basically is able to continue that reaction sort of endlessly if you will and if you think about sort of the the fission reaction we just saw there with the bowling pin uh, we sort of started it off with a neutron hitting something and then this guy made two new nucleuses a bunch of neutrons or a number of neutrons are formed right and some energy and with the idea behind the chain reaction is really the products here are neutrons, which frankly is what is used to start the reaction. So basically it can come back around and hit some more of that starting material and kind of continue the reaction to basically expand exponentially. And that's where we, what we see here. So if we do have the critical mass, this reaction will basically keep going basically uncontrollably. And each sort of fission thought, you're going to be making some radioactive products. You also will be giving off a lot of energy along the way, which is probably not so good. If you keep it sort of under control a little bit and keep the mass to a non-critical sort of amount, um, it will sort of die out the reaction. It won't sort of continuously to expand sort of exponentially. Uh, traditional sort of nuclear bombs, kind of this idea you have sort of a subcritical mass of uranium, for example, there, separated over there. And when this thing hits, there's a little bit of an explosion that occurs, which will allow our triangle amount to basically come and complete it. And now you have a critical mass of uranium that's come together, and that would kick off, obviously, a nuclear chain reaction, which obviously would leave behind a lot of energy and a lot of radioactive byproducts for a lot, a lot of years. That reaction is also the reaction is used in a traditional nuclear power plant, as I mentioned before, kind of the traditional power routes outside of wind and all that is uh, basically you have water. And you basically heat the water. When you heat the water, you get steam, right? Steam is used to go out to the turbines, to the generators, right? And basically you get lights at that point, right? So really the difference between say a, a traditional power plant that uses coal and a nuclear power plant uh, that uses a fission reaction is the source of the heat, basically to heat the water. So in a coal power plant, they burned coal uh, and obviously use the heat to heat the water. In a nuclear power plant, they basically do a fission reaction. So they have in there what are referred to as uh, fuel rods. And fuel rods are basically pencil-sized pellets of uranium basically in there. And that's basically where the fission reaction takes place. As a fission reaction takes place, it obviously is going to be separating, creating a lot of energy. And you can see there's sort of a isolated chamber of water that's in there. That obviously is gonna heat up the water to a larger tub of water, which will create the steam that is necessary to go out to the turbines and obviously create the power uh, that's needed in a nuclear power plant. Typically, though, uh, if you take the steam and all that good stuff and you cool it back down, you get water, right? So a lot of times nuclear power plants are near large bodies of water, like ours over there in San Onofre, right there by the ocean, right? So they use a lot of the water there to cool it back down, sort of recycle the water. If it's inland, like in the one in Arizona, if you ever driven off the 10 there, uh, Palo Verde, uh, there's the big nuclear power plant over there. They have really big cooling towers, which um, have a lot of water in it. They use that to sort of cool it down. So why does this reaction not go out of control? They do a couple of safety things, usually in a nuclear power plant. Uh, they keep it at a subcritical mass, usually, the, the uh, material. 
And they also have in their control rods inserted in there. So usually where the re fission reaction happens, they have control rods. Control rods are soaked with things like cadmium and, and other elements like that, which are good neutron absorbers. Why would neutron absorbers be really good in a fission reaction? What starts the reaction and keeps the reaction going? Basically the neutrons, right? They keep coming around. So with these control rods, what they do is basically grab out some neutrons from the reaction. That helps keep obviously the reaction under control and not going out of control and crazy. Also nuclear power plants, if you've driven by, usually have very big domes of cement, right? And that is to keep obviously the nuclear part of the reaction away from the sort of non-nuclear part of the reaction and keep everything in there. There is benefits and uh, not so good benefits of both types of power, right? When you burn coal, you create a lot of pollutants, right? Uh, you also have to strip a lot of land there to get the coal to burn, um, creates a lot of those pollutants. Obviously in a nuclear power plant, the byproducts of fission reactions are things that are radioactive for a very long time and they have half-lives for a very, very long time. That is sometimes referred to as spent fuel, the kind of byproducts of the uh, fission reactions and stuff that is made. And those things are also very radioactive for a long period of time. So the problem has always been, where do you do with all of it, right? Where do you store it? Nobody wants it near them or anything like that. So years ago, they decided to build a big hole in the desert there in Nevada, right? That's how they keep the neon lights up and all that good things. Um, but for a lot of years, they weren't using that because nobody wanted it transported across their neighborhoods there to uh, Nevada. I think they're starting to use it now. Um, so a lot of times what they would do actually is keep a lot of this stuff kind of on site because uh, they had really nowhere to put it. A lot of our nuclear power plants are not operational anymore, right, um, in the country. Uh, to keep them up to code and stuff like that. They've just sort of let them be and not use them as much. I think at this point, I don't think they use either one of the ones over there in San Onofre. I could be wrong, but I think they've stopped using it a few years ago. Uh, so again, you know, there's benefits and not so good things for each of those things. Obviously, in a nuclear situation, uh, in terms of the waste, it's not as simple as just like we keep it there for a little bit, right? Things with half-lives of hundreds to thousands of years means that those things are going to be pretty active for a very long period of time. So it creates the idea of who watches it, who keeps hold of it, where do you store it, um, which is a lot of the, the issues. And as you can see here, this is a chart of some of the spent fuel. If you just look at the storage time in years that you need to do on a lot of these things, uh, we're talking hundreds to thousands of years that these things are still relatively pretty active and stuff like that. So, you know, there's good and bad with everything, I suppose. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Nuclear fusion is a little bit different than fission. So in a fusion reaction, unlike a fission reaction where something sort of separates out into or breaks apart into two new nucleuses and gives off neutrons and energy, in a fusion reaction, we're actually fusing two smaller atoms together uh, to make, say, a larger atom. In a very, very hot temperature, like I'm walking on the sun type temperature, uh, very, very high, high temperatures uh, that this occurs, which is why all those spy movies, right, they're always after the guy that can do cold fusion, right, under normal temperatures. Uh, they're always looking for those guys. Now... As you can see, there are a couple of hydrogens coming together uh, and lithium hydrogen to create a larger one. And But again, the difference between fission and fusion, two smaller guys for fission at really high temperatures, uh, fission, regular temperature sort of breaking apart. We also use radioisotopes a lot of times in medicine. Um, so um, here are some examples of some things that are used in medicine. Uh, Sodium-24 is a blood tracer. Um, Iodine-131 for thyroid. Um, Technetium-99 uh, for imaging. The nice thing about radioactive isotopes, right, and sort of regular elements, say, in your body is they basically perform the same chemistry. So chemistry is basically 
electrons happening, right? And reactions that occur with electrons and those type of things, bonds being broken and bonds being made. So very often neutrons and protons aren't involved. So if you kind of substitute in a radioactive version of a element into say the body or something like that, it will basically behave the same way as the non-radioactive version of of that element in your body. The difference is it has radioactivity, which means you can very much follow what is going on with that particular guy uh, in your body. And you could do some imaging, as you can see here in this picture, it will sort of highlight everything. In a research sort of laboratory, if you're doing some type of experiment, for example, uh, involving copper, and you're interested in what happens with copper throughout, say, a, a protein, um, uh, mechanism or something like that. You could use a radioactive version, say, of copper, and you can just follow the radioactivity, and you'll know exactly where the copper ends up, where the copper goes, by where the radioactivity does. Uh, I did a lot of research with that. We used radioactive copper 64 and copper 68, and but just by following the radioactivity through, say, a pur protein purification, you could see where basically the copper ended up and where it didn't end up by just following the radioactivity. In addition, they also, and I think they still do, use radioactive uh, isotopes, and they sometimes will insert it into like tumors and stuff like that to try to shrink them down. Um, that's very common. Obviously, if you are using anything that is sort of radioactive, you typically would want something with a shorter half-life, right? Otherwise, your follow-up appointment is going to be way down the road. Um, so you definitely would want some small half-lives. Um, hours, maybe days at the most. You obviously wouldn't be using anything that would probably have half-lives of many, many years because um, that would be pretty potent as you would be moving around. Uh, here's a bone scan there, and you can see basically all that is being highlighted by radioactive um, material. When we do use radioactive uh, material, oftentimes you will use one of these guys, which is a Geiger counter. Geiger counter is pretty much what it looks like. It has a wand and it usually gives an audio sound of click, 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 click. And if you hear a lot of clicking, that's a lot of radioactivity. If you're not so much, you know, you don't have so much going on there. But usually you'll use this uh, in an area where you are using radioactivity. Um, usually, like I said before, you oftentimes would wear like a uh, ring they usually give you, a little badge if you're working with radioactive material and every so often they'll develop those things and tell you perhaps you should take a vacation because you're glowing now uh, but you know it's make sure you're not getting exposed to too much uh, radioactivity uh, usually if you have to clean up a site or when you're using it you usually go around for example the laboratory with a geiger counter after you cleaned up where you were using it to make sure it's obviously safe for everybody else to go around if i just hold the geiger counter up in the air will it make noise it will. There's background radiation, which is also what you hear in the laboratory. Ah, it's just background radiation. Don't worry about it. <laughs> You're good. Um, <clears throat> but there is obviously uh, background radiation, so it shouldn't be going off super loud, but you will hear a little bit of it going off. Um, and there's always some radiation in the background. With that being said, we sometimes will look at radiation and some of the factors uh, that affect it. Uh, here's some exposure of radiation, cosmic rays, um, medical x-rays, air travel. I guess if you live near nuclear waste or fallout from nuclear weapons, I suppose, uh, we all get some type of uh, radioactivity as well. It's really important, as I mentioned before, if you ever should work with anything that's radioactive uh, to understand uh, what type of emitter it is. Again, different levels of protection is needed. Uh, especially if it's a gamma emitter versus, say, an alpha emitter. And you want to make sure that you always uh, know that for yourself and protect yourself. The other important thing is not being around it for a long period of time, right? So the exposure time is also really important, um, you know, when you're dealing with it. Two things that we look at is, uh, is referred to as a rad, which is a radiation absorbed dose and sort of the equivalent for a man, which is a ram. And the REM is really the rad times the quality factor. And that has to do with really the type of emission. You can see it's a much smaller number there for uh, gamma rays and beta rays, which penetrate much further than say something like an alpha particle, which doesn't penetrate as far 